Joining me now, we have the great Pennsylvania Senator, Pat Toomey. So, Senator Toomey, I just want to ask you, you know, when you read the notes from uh, Mr. Biden's uh, presser this morning, or I was a Democratic, some kind of Democratic meeting, he says it's really, you know, it's Vladimir Putin's inflation. What do you think of that, Senator Toomey? Yeah, look, uh, <laughs> I just give the American people a lot more credit than that. Like, do you think that maybe they didn't notice last year? <laughs> I mean, like, come on. Hey, you did a great job laying out the case. Gas prices were up 40 percent before Vladimir Putin got anywhere close to the Ukrainian border. The, the people aren't going to fall for this nonsense. And by the way, the, the, I think I figured out what the administration's energy policy is. Um, they're, of course, they're pleading with Maduro and Venezuela to increase production. They're probably about to reach a deal with Iran where there'll be more Iranian oil coming to the market. They're trying to get the Saudis and the uh, the, the Emiratis to take their call. So I guess the policy <laughs> is we, we, we want to burn a lot more energy just as long as it's not American. It's <laughs> unbelievable. You know what Rick Perry said the other night? He said, as a as beginning of a solution, uh, instead of uh, all these uh, envoys to Iran and Venezuela, Rick suggested a special envoy goes to uh, Midland, Texas, so they could meet the and have a peace treaty with the American. Uh, and I just, yeah, I love Pennsylvania that. Pennsylvania would be a good idea, too. Well, okay, we'll go to Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, and I thought maybe we could go to Alberta because we actually have friendly relations with Alberta and they're dying to give us almost a million barrels a day more if we had a Keystone Pipeline. Unbelievable. Let, let's, let's burn all the energy we can as long as it's not American. Yeah, it's a sad tale. So here's a couple other nuggets for you, Senator. Um, first of all, deficit spending has a lot to do with the inflation problem. Deficit spending under the Biden administration, we did beat the BBB back, at least for now, but that yeah. one last March. And then, of course, the Federal Reserve buying the bonds and right. printing the money, uh, money supply is still growing. I was very disappointed, Senator, in um, the easy passage of this omnibus discretionary spending bill. Look, I'm a, a military hawk. I'm glad we refund the defense, but I'm not glad at the domestic stuff. I'm not glad at the earmarks. And also, right. I haven't heard anyone talk about how we're going to pay uh, for the $1.5 trillion. How are we going to pay for that? Uh, yeah, well, by a combination of borrowing and printing money the way we've been, right. uh, which is which is hugely problematic. I do totally agree. There's not a great mystery as to why we've had the highest inflation in 40 years. It's because wildly excessive spending and, and easy money will catch up to the economy. And, and it's here. And it's a problem. And unfortunately, I've got a lot of colleagues that think that, you know, there's just an unlimited amount of money we can spend. And, um, you know, our Democratic colleagues have, uh, have a principle that they adhere to. It is, you know, don't just stand there, spend something. No. And so they, you know, they've been at it. Um, it's a problem, Larry. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's just so disappointing that we are GOP conservatives, myself included. We're blaming Biden's deficit spending. Okay. And he deserves the blame. He'll never accept that. He won't own that. I get that. But nonetheless, the public sees very clearly. I mean, today's Wall Street Journal, the new poll, I think, shows he's still down at 41 percent approval or 42 percent approval. So he's in the tank. But, you know, Senator Toomey, um, I would have liked to see some Republican leaders really bellyache out loud about this latest round, this one and a half trillion dollars. Uh, of deficit spending. That's all I'm saying. There's a shiny object, was the Ukraine money, whatever it was, $14 billion. Most folks favor that. I get that. But still, nobody even raised the issue, and I dare say hardly anybody even read the bill. Well, so uh, I'm going to push back a little bit here, Larry, because there were a number of us voted against this bill for exactly this reason. Uh, Mike Braun, to his credit, offered an amendment to strike all the earmarks, which mm. I supported mm -hmm. and a number of Republicans supported, but we didn't have the votes to pass it. Um, so I mean, we put up a fight, but um, they had 60 votes. And when you've got 60 votes on the floor of the U.S. Senate, you can roll the other 40 members. It's, it was not exactly 40, but 
That's the problem. We were just outvoted, Larry, but we did put up the fight. Well, that's a good pushback, and I like that a lot. Congrats, you, Mike Braun, and the others. Uh, I bet I could count which ones. It's just that, I don't know, you know, I would have taken a CR and, and had a public discussion for a bunch of weeks, maybe some regular yeah. order, some hearings. Totally. We should, look, we should have separated out the Ukraine money, which I think right. every Republican would have enthusiastically supported that part. But they roll it in with so much garbage, huge increases in domestic programs that already had increases, uh, the earmarks that are just obscene. You know, for so many years, we were able to get rid of these earmarks, wasteful pork, bar you know, pork barrel projects that uh, uh, very, very often can't withstand scrutiny. But they're back. Uh, it, was a, it was a sad day on the Senate floor. Yes, sir. I agree, 100 percent. And I, I'm going to editorialize for about the hundredth time. Gosh, are we going to miss you when you retire? I might well, have to come down there and talk you out of retirement, but that's, <laughs> that's a different segment entirely. <laughs> that would be a tough one. <laughs> I, I know. Well, I helped you when you first ran many you years did. ago. You I, did. And that is correct. It was one of my best investments. And I appreciate it. One of my best investments ever. So let my me wife still hasn't. My wife still hasn't forgiven you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me ask, though, if we're not going to stop deficit spending, and we're not going to stop money creation. I'm going to get to the Fed in a minute, because you may actually win one on the Fed. Um, and we're not going to stop Fed money printing. And Biden uh, it shows no signs of stopping the, what I call the regulatory octopus, which is yeah. preventing any, not, you know, not just public lands, but private lands with these crazy yeah, so, you know, social cost of carbon nonsense. Right. So if we're not going to do that, we're going to keep increasing demand. We're going to keep reducing <laughs> supply. Um, no. I don't know how you get out of this inflation picture. I don't see it, and that's why I say this will not end well. I, that I'm, look, I've been concerned for a long time, Larry, that we will not get this spending under control until we have a financial circumstances that force it on us. Mm. And if this is the path we go on, if we keep overspending massively, running these huge deficits, and the Fed is very, very slow to tighten, then I'm afraid inflation accelerates, it gets worse, mm -hmm. and at some point, interest rates are going to reflect that. Mm -hmm. And when they do, it's going to be really hard servicing this mountain of debt we've created. And that might end up being the mechanism that finally forces some kind of fiscal discipline. But as you point out, that'll be an ugly moment if that's what it takes. Yeah, usually these things do not end well. There's no soft landing. Right. I mean, already estimates from uh, the Penn Warden model and others uh, typical families are going to have to pay $3,500 more from the inflation tax. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just saw the Atlanta Fed's wage tracker shows average wages up about 6%. So inflation is rising. You know, the CPI is rising close to 8%. So real, right. real wages seem to be falling. I mean, none of this is good. Let me ask you just quickly a couple quick things yeah. on the Fed. Um, when Jay Powell spoke, I guess it was last week, uh, to the House and Senate Banking Committees. I don't remember. He was in some hearings. Yeah, he was and, at both. And I recall, I was reading something last night. My, my pal French Hill, you know, smart, smart French Hill from Arkansas, he and some others raised a little ruckus that the Fed did not put the Taylor Rule models yeah. into their uh, report. And right. Jay Powell said, whoa, gee whiz, I didn't know that, and we must have yeah. forgotten it, and I'm going to look into that. You know, John Taylor may not be precisely right. He never claimed to be. But the Taylor rule that he pioneered gives you a pretty good sense of whether the Fed is, you know, right track, wrong track. So I'm just going to note the Taylor rule today would suggest 9.5% federal yeah. funds yeah. rate. Yeah. The Fed is beating its chest, and they're going to raise it by one quarter of a point at the meeting next week with an 8 percent inflation rate. Now, that ain't inflationary restraint, Senator Toomey. I, I've asked uh, Chairman Powell and other members uh, of the Fed Board of Governors, do you really think you get inflation under control maintaining negative real interest rates? Right. And I'm skeptical about that. And he was asked uh, by Senator Haggerty from Tennessee, uh -huh. uh, Chairman Powell was asked about the omission of the Taylor rule from their most recent semiannual report. Uh, so I, I got a feeling it'll be in the next one. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying we should go to nine and a half percent, but I also know that John Taylor's intent was to raise alarms, you know, directional signals. 
And, right. you know, this one, as you say, real interest rates of, you know, 7 or 8% negative real rates is not going to do and, the trick. And it should be in the discussion. Yes. Like, why, really? Which is closer, the zero we're at or the 9% that right. the Taylor rule would That's recommend? Right. Gee. <laughs> now, last one. Um, yeah. Looks like you might win uh, on this uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin business. Uh, she's the radical leftist uh, climate change person. No bank loans to fossil fuel companies and so forth and so on. And also her goings on with her fintech company in uh, Colorado. Um, you led the walkout, no vote. Uh, Sherrod, uh, Sherrod, um, the Sherrod Brown. The Sherrod term. Brown, sorry, excuse Senator Brown, it's not personal. Um, he's furious at you and the rest of your colleagues. But Joe Manchin seems to be throwing in with you. What I'm getting at is the latest rumor is that the White House will pull the nomination, which would be a great victory for you because you fought this. What do you hear? What can you tell us on that? Are they going to pull the nomination I, on, I really uh, on Raskin? I really don't know. And, and as you might imagine, they, they don't give me a heads up on that sort no. of thing. But look, let me be clear. It's a, her, her, she has spent two years campaigning for the idea that the Fed should be in the business of allocating capital away from carbon intensive uh, sources of energy. L just look around us right now. We see what's happening. We see what's happening to Europe going down that road. We see what's happening to our own gas prices. Can you imagine having someone at the Fed who thinks we have to make this much worse? But there's another whole set of problems, and you alluded to them, which is the refusal of Ms. Raskin to answer very basic, very reasonable questions that are the appropriate questions that the Committee of Jurisdiction would normally ask of a nominee to an important post like a 10-year term on the, on the Federal Reserve. So um, it, until we get answers to our questions, uh, we, we don't intend to proceed. And um, Senator Manchin did make the observation. Yeah. We could confirm at all the other Fed noms. Yeah. We've offered that. I offered that. Back when this first came up weeks and weeks ago, our Democratic colleagues have chosen not to confirm Chairman Powell and Lael Brainerd and Lisa Cook and uh, Philip Jefferson, all of whom uh, would be able to be processed and could ultimately be con confirmed. They don't want to do that. Mm. They want to well, they want to hold out. So we'll see what happens. All right. Senator Toomey, thank you. We're going to leave it there. Thanks, I hope Larry. the cavalry's coming. Truly.